Hi, I'm Joel Bryce, Vice President of Waterfowl and Hunter Recruitment Programs with Delta Waterfowl. And welcome to our second podcast in a series of videos and podcasts that are introducing you to the science and biology that drive waterfowl management. In today's podcast, we're going to talk about waterfowl recruitment, or better known as duck production. Um, we're sitting here on the shores of the Missouri River, south of Bismarck, North Dakota. And today's guest is Frank Rohr, uh, Dr. Frank Rohr. He's Delta's president and chief scientist. Welcome, Frank. Thanks, Joel. All right. So you got a sweet little spot here for us to, to look at. We've got a few ducks, a few geese out here. Uh, tell us what you've been seeing so far this spring. Well, we're kind of late in the migration right now. We've had uh, thousands and thousands of cacklers move through. The resident Canada geese arrived about three weeks ago, and, and they're actually starting to nest now. Um, cacklers are just finishing passing through some snow geese. We had cranes migrating yesterday, so a lot of ducks use the river uh, when they're migrating past. So. Yeah. Not near as many as in pothole country, but, but it's still a nice view. So. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty distracting yeah. in a good way. Yeah. Some organsers, some Canada's yeah. all back, so that's pretty cool. So. I guess before we, we jump into today's subject, let's go back to our last podcast. You were also the guest there, um, a pretty knowledgeable guy, um, fun to talk to. So the last podcast we talked about duck population carrying capacity, or basically the number of ducks that can potentially fit in an area. Right. Um, so Frank, you know, we, we spent half an hour talking about that. Can you just give us a Cliff's Notes version of, of what we're talking about by duck population carrying capacity? Right. Well, carrying capacity is the maximum number of, of animals you can have in a habitat. And of course, ducks migrate, but the key driver of, of duck populations is what happens on the prairies, mm -hmm. here on the breeding grounds. And, and the key driver of how many ducks you can have in a chunk of habitat is the wetland, the number of wetlands. So, you know, in great habitat out in, in North Dakota or Manitoba, you'll have in a square mile 130 wetlands mm -hmm. in, in really good habitat. And in those areas, you can have 100 pairs per square mile. But you go to the boreal forest where there are much lower densities of wetlands, and we're talking about five pairs of ducks per square mile. But it's all driven by the wetland basin. So so that's what that's what sets the upper limit on how many ducks you can have in an area. So that's, okay. that's your carrying your carrying capacity. That's the potential for production. Okay, so yeah. on the U.S. and Canadian prairies, seas of, of wetlands still today, uh, some areas brighter than others. Yeah. How much of the production, continental production, can come from what we call the prairie pothole region? Well, the prairie pothole region is is dominating production. We, we estimate anywhere from 50 to up to 80 percent of the ducks, depending on what species you're talking about, come from the prairie pothole region. This is that grassland region that starts, used to cover Iowa, and of course we drain the wetlands in Iowa, but but covers the Dakotas, western Minnesota, mm -hmm. out into Montana, and then on up into Prairie Canada, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. And, and that's a relatively small chunk of the total breeding habitat, maybe 10%, mm -hmm. but it counts for 50% of the ducks. So you can see why we concentrate there. So. Wow. So, yeah. No, that's impressive. Yeah. I think when, you know, we always say if everyone could come to the prairies, they'd see it too, they'd get it. Yeah. But, uh, oh, I firmly believe all duck hunters should come to the prairies and see nesting biology and see what happens during the production part of the year. It's just an eye opener and really impresses yeah. you with what we can do and the problems we face. So, yeah. No, that's awesome. So we're going to build off of the last podcast, the last discussion of carrying capacity, and so you just kind of refreshed us that with carrying capacity, um, it's wetlands that set the table. Right. Kind of basically determine how big of a population yep. you could get. But now we're going to switch gears to waterfowl recruitment. Uh, we call it duck production. Um, you know, that is basically what determines whether a population of ducks increases, decreases, or stays the same. So, so Frank, when we're talking about duck production, there's a lot of variables at play. Can you give us a quick introduction into, into what that means? Right. Uh, waterfowl biologists basically split production into a variety of things. So we have the pairs that settle, okay? That's the carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. And we can't have more pairs than, than we have wetlands because they're mostly territorial. But then we have a variety of things that we'd like to measure. What fraction of hens nest? So that's breeding propensity. And then when they nest, how many eggs do they lay? 
And most importantly, do the eggs hatch? Mm -hmm. Does the hen survive? Because hens are vulnerable. Males don't incubate. Only females incubate the eggs. So we have to look at hen survival as well. And then brood survival. And then if nests fail, many ducks will re-nest. And so we add a re-nesting loop where we go back and say, okay, what's the probability if you lost your first nest, you start a second one? But the key drivers of the whole thing are nest success, that's the number one driver, and then hen success and brood survival. So hen survival and brood survival. So those three things overwhelmingly drive duck production. So right, right. you gotta set the table, you gotta have wetlands, gotta have pears. But then you can do all that and have very low production when we have 5% nest success. And we've seen that unfortunately in a lot of areas recently. So. Right. So you did a great, yeah, you did a great um, video previously talking about, you know, a pie chart, hoax yeah. pie chart, talking right. about all the drivers that, that cause a population to go up, down, or stay the same. What, what really, what stuck out from Well, from the that, Hochman right? figure, I love the Hochman figure. Now, you know, every waterfowl biologist for 50 years, if you work on the prairies, come up here and see some duck nests, find a bunch of nests and you go back and check them the next week and you find most of them are destroyed. Mm -hmm. You knew, every waterfowl biologist worked on the prairies knew that nest success was the big driver. And we focused on that in terms of management for years. Hochman took this huge study and just did a very quantitative analysis. And so he, he made it very clear that nest success is the big driver. You know, 43% of what impacts a mallard population is driven just by nest success. So I love that figure for that. But but the figure was not, you know, earth shattering for waterfowl biologists. I, you know, I'd done that stuff for 30 years and knew perfectly well that nest success and brood survival are the two big keys and, and hen survival. So, so that's what the Hopeman figure pointed out is, is the importance of that. And the flip side is it, it pointed out the relative unimportance of the wintering grounds. You know, right. we, we have a lot of wintering habitat. We have the food. Ducks feed in agricultural land. They're not food, you know, limited. Mm -hmm. And so, so it really pointed out sort of the importance of the breeding grounds and the importance of those three drivers, nest success, hen survival, and brood survival. Yeah, you know, I guess if it take a common sense approach to it, yeah, you, you would think, because you know, one hen can turn into you know, nine offspring. So I guess yeah. that makes sense. But, you know, I know I go back earlier in my career, um, avian botulism was, cleanup was something. Yeah. Right. Coincidentally, Delta Research said that that didn't um, slow the spread of avian botulism, right. picking right. up dead carcasses. But I know we would pick up hundreds and hundreds of dead ducks that had died from avian botulism. Yeah. And you think, man, how can hunting and disease and other forms of mortality not impact the population? But but yeah, that, that science just yeah. really does say the breeding grounds are where it's at. Right, right. So, you know, I, I, I'm kind of this romantic when it comes to, I always say I was born 200 years too late. And, you know, I think of the prairies the way they used to be. And, you know, Lewis and Clark came up this river a couple hundred years ago. And, um, but the world has really changed from pre-settlement to today. Yeah. And, and it's had some negative consequences on waterfowl. And so we talked about, you know, you lose the water, you lose the ducks, but what has been the consequence of converting grassland nesting habitat into ag production when right. it comes to waterfowl? Well, when you think about the prairie pothole region, it's 90% of it is owned by farmers and ranchers, okay? And some of that best, you know, habitat we have in North Dakota is intensively farmed. and and we made two major changes. You know, most waterfowl guys like you and I would, would love to have seen it in 1750 when there was this sea of grass. Mm -hmm. and, and in those days, I suspect nest success was outrageously high. You had 100% grassland, and then you had a very different predator community. And so we know that the predator community plays a huge role in nest success. Um, red fox are, are relatively new. Raccoons are completely new out here, mm -hmm. and those are probably the two most significant predators. We had a very different predator landscape in the Dakotas with, with a wolf dominated and a swift fox, and, and so different predators are, are of different importance to ducks. So we now have a landscape that has relatively little grass, 
It's mostly farm. It, right. You know, farmer can't make money on on grass. He makes money on corn and beans and and wheat and canola. And so that landscape in the spring is not attractive for duck nesting. And so right. what you have is the margins. Now we're not in the crop landscape, but think of this lot as this would have been the farmland and the margin would have been this little tiny strip of cover here. And that's where the ducks nest. And when they have just tiny strips of cover, they're more vulnerable to predators. So, right. so the lack of grass and the change in the predator community means that we now have nest success that in many areas, it's, you know, five, ten percent, which is below break even. And so right. we think of break even nest success, and it's not that it's not as high as you'd think it was. It's fifteen percent for mallards, but mallards renest a lot. So for other ducks it's probably twenty percent nest success is necessary for the population to remain stable. But in a lot of areas we're way below that. And what's really frustrating in a lot of those areas, we've spent a ton of our money to protect the habitat. Mm -hmm. We've put easements on wetlands. We have the wetlands protected, and yet we're getting no duck production. So that's craziness in my view. So, yeah. yeah. So there's this concept out there called the habitat threshold. Yeah. Now it's right. changed over time, I think just even in the last 10 to 20 years. But talk about the concept of habitat threshold. Here, here's a, a great biologist, he's retired now, but a guy named Ron Reynolds had this really cool study. We had, we had known that there was a habitat threshold, and the habitat threshold that, that you're talking about is what amount of grass, so we're talking about grass, we're talking right. about the nesting habitat, do you need to get to that break-even nest success level, right? And so, and the concept is simple. Ducks nest in the grass, and if you have a sea of grass, then a duck nest is a needle in the haystack. And mm -hmm. so you're trying to hide duck nests from predators, just spread them out enough. Predators don't find them. So Ron Reynolds went out and chose four square mile study blocks that had a, this huge range of grass because of CRP. Mm -hmm. And some of them were 100% grass, like four square miles of grass. Beautiful, like, you know, hitting the prairies in 1700. And others were, you know, like intensively farmed and had 5% grass. And he looked at nest success in a whole series of plots, lots of them, like 100. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what he found is that you have to have 40% of the landscape in grass if that's your sole method of making duck nests safe, is Jeez. to hide them. And 40% in an agricultural landscape is just not very realistic unless you have a huge government program like CRP. So, right. so uh, you know, the habitat threshold was frighteningly high. We cannot buy enough of the prairies with our duck stamp dollars and habitat dollars to get to 40% grass. So, so for years and years, we focused our management on proving nest success. And one of the ideas, well, let's just buy grass and plant it. But small patches of grass don't help. You gotta have a landscape approach. Right. And we can't get to 40% with, with wildlife dollars in my no opinion. no it does sound right. you know i think for i think for for uh, for most duck hunters you think you know just just add grass yeah right just right. add grass right yeah and you hit those high yeah. points i mean it's yeah. it's yeah it's expensive farmers right. farmers want to farm yeah they don't want to right. put their their property right. into grass all not all that um properties available yeah. um so yeah i mean at, at delta you know we feel that you know, it's the government incentive-based, you know, grassland programs like CRP in the United States right. or GROW right. um, emerging in Manitoba, Canada um, are the way to go. Yeah. Adding grass helps, and if we can get ag policy that, that adds grass, we're all for it. But mm -hmm. basically spending our wildlife dollars on grass, you know, I think that's a, a losing cause. I'd rather spend right. them on more active management that we know improves nest success. So. But, you know, grass is beneficial in all sorts of ways. It slows down runoff. We're worried about, you know, uh, uh, nitrogen and phosphates in rivers. You know, this river water is eventually going to end up in the Gulf of Mexico where we have, uh, you know, a dead zone from too much, right. too much fertilizer. So grass helps with that. Grass helps with flooding. Grass helps with carbon sequestration. So, so there are lots of reasons to plant grass, but it's got to be a government program in, yeah. in, in my view. Yeah. Yeah, and with incentives, I guess, yeah. you know, going some of my earlier years as a field biologist um, for Delta and, and elsewhere, you know, I worked really closely with landowners. And I think when you're 
competing to yep. purchase land. Oh, I yeah. guess competing is the word oh, there. Yeah. I mean, oh, there, yeah. it's, um, yeah. it, it doesn't make for the, the friendliest situations at yeah. times, and it doesn't have to be that way. Right. So, one word. Why are these nests failing? Oh, nests fail because of predation. Yeah. I mean, the overwhelming majority of eggs in the prairies get eaten by predators. That's, that's just the fact of life. Um, when we talk about nest failure, Anywhere, in most studies, it's from 80 to 95% of nest failures due to predation. Mm -hmm. and, and that accounts for the vast majority of eggs. So, so that's what we're trying to manage in, in everything we do on the prairies to improve production. It's largely about trying to improve nest success, trying to get eggs to hatch. Nests fail because a predator finds a nest and eats the eggs. So, yeah. so we're trying to you know get nests out of harm's way or or deal with the predators more directly. So. That's basically waterfowl yeah. recruitment in a nutshell right yep. there. Yeah. So in a, at Delta, you know, so I guess our members know that duck production is a big part of who we are at, as an organization at Delta. But also, you know, we as staff and our members, you know, we do, we love habitat protection. We oh, love yeah. the long-term right. uh, battle, the long-term gains. Right. Um, but, but we also, our membership definitely values raising ducks today and yeah. and they value um, what we do and the concept of of raising ducks on existing habitat so so the concept of duck production um you know delta has a nest structure program and a trapping program but but duck production's efforts have been going on for decades right oh Frank? for years years yeah I mean, I'm obviously not a uh, you know a young waterfowl biologist. I've been around for a while, working at Delta on the prairies for, gosh, nearly 40 years now. And and most of our management efforts and and our science has been a lot of it has been, what works and what doesn't. And unfortunately, we've found an awful lot of cases of what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we talked about grass. So we we've had lots and lots of programs to plant grass, and we've done lots of evaluations. We had a program called Adopt Pothole where we, we were protecting a pothole, but we were also planting grass, a strip of grass around it. And right. we evaluated it and found out, you know what? We didn't improve nest success at all by planting a small strip of grass. Small grass doesn't work. So, um, and we've done lots of those evaluations. So evaluations of grass planting have largely shown that we just can't get there. We can't plant it at a large enough scale right. with our dollars. Um, we've tried lots of things. I remember, um, you know, looking at nest structures, and and they just didn't work. The original nest structures were baskets. We put a steel pole in the ground and and had three rebars coming up and a piece of of, of chicken wire, and then like we put straw. Down in. Cone. Yeah, yeah. And, and it would look like that, and and it was some mallards would nest in it, but. The best we'd ever get to was about 30% of them being used. And that means 70% of what you're doing was not effective. Not even used. Not even used, wow. right. Now, that's by mallards. That was our target. Mallards are the most adaptable ducks, so they would use these things. And pintails, we never had a pintail nest in them, or blue wings, or gadwall, or any of the other ducks that nest on the prairies. Now, Canada geese have spread rapidly, and they use those things. But, mm -hmm. but Canada do, geese do great without any management. They don't need in fact, to help. yeah. We're at the point in North Dakota where it's the number one landowner concern is too many Canada geese eating their crops. So, um, so these nest structures, I, I wrote off nest structures. And then we had two different styles of nest structures come in. I remember one board member, uh, a guy named Jim Shear, brought a nest structure from Ohio. It was a tunnel and I said, ah, that won't work. Ducks don't use nest, we can't get high enough use rates. And then we tested them at Delta, and as you know, hen houses are super effective. Right. It's just a roll, and it's covered over the top. And so the hen has some overhead cover. And incredible use rates, 80% use rates in a lot of areas. So that made the difference, and exceptionally high nest success. So, so that was a success story, but there aren't too many of them. Um, other structures. We tried culverts. This is one of my favorite. I thought this was super cool. The prairies often go dry, mm -hmm. and so you can take a big cement culvert, you know, 36 inch culvert, yep. you know, and stand it upright in a pond, okay, and then fill it with dirt with your backhoe, 
Okay? And then the thing grows its own cover, and mallards loved them. And so the central flyway went nuts and started putting these things out everywhere. And they looked very effective because the culvert with the dirt, you didn't have to do maintenance, right? But 10 years later, we realized that that movie Titanic was relevant <laughs> because the pond thaws out and it thaws from the edge. And then you have this miniature iceberg. And when the wind shifts and blows hard, it flows into this culvert and knocks them over. Mm -hmm. So I know of one culvert in North Dakota that is upright. I've taken a lot of pictures of that one because hmm. it's on a tiny, tiny wetland, not much bigger than the, you know, twice the diameter of, you know, the six feet we're apart. And so uh, these culverts are all laying flat and completely ineffective management. Now we spent, hmm. you know, tons of money on those. Um, another one of my favorites, when I saw this first in, in Minnesota, I was just blown away. You know, I'd been working on the prairies and seeing this 5%, 10% terrible nest success. And then I went to a fence in Minnesota and nest searched with the guys, and they were getting 60% nest success. So here's the deal. Predators are the problem. Mm -hmm. You put up a fence on 40 acres. That's a pretty big fence, right? Right. And you have to electrify it, and you exclude the predators. And ducks respond to one another. And so you get ducks coming into the fenced area and nesting, and they were having great success. And so, and they key off one another. Now, let me back up. We've talked about territorial behavior and mm -hmm. carrying capacity. Right. Ducks are territorial about the water, not where they put their nest. And so you can have mallards from, you know, four miles away nesting in the same field. They'll clump up in that field because it's great habitat for nesting, they don't defend nest sites, they defend water and the food resources in there. And so you're gonna have incredible densities of nests in one field. And we were getting that in these fences. Hmm. And so we put, we spent millions and millions of dollars putting fences out all over the prairies. And then uh, a couple of smart guys said, hey, let's look at the duckling exodus. And it was a disaster. So. All the eggs hatch, mom leads the ducklings away, right? They never come back to the nest. Mom walks up to the fence, and the fence is, is either one inch mesh welded wire or can be a, a chain link fence. Right. And a duckling goes right through that there. Ducklings are so small, they have to go through a one inch square hole like it's no resistance at mm -hmm. all. But mom doesn't. So mom walked the perimeter of the fence you know, she's just never experienced a fence before in evolutionary time. Didn't so think she to doesn't fly think over. to just fly over it. It's only a four foot, five foot high fence. So she walks the perimeter. It took hens 28 hours before they flew out. She won't leave her ducklings. She just walked <laughs> in a circle. Meanwhile, hawks are sitting on the fence posts and hawks ate the ducklings. So he had no production because of duckling survival. Oh. And so we actually tore out all the fences in the Dakotas and throughout Prairie Canada. So we spent millions on fences and fences didn't work. Um, There's a few similar ones like um, islands. Islands. And right. peninsula cutoffs. That's right. What are some of the pitfalls of those and yeah. successes? Yeah, we'll do another movie analogy. You build it and they will come. Well, ducks are hardwired to like islands, right? Ducks are well aware that predators are their problem. Okay, and so when they see an island, they just naturally go there because red fox don't like to swim very much, so red fox won't go to an mm -hmm. island. Uh, if the island's far enough out in a big wetland, then raccoons are not likely to get there. Now, mink are always a problem, right. but, but islands can have very high nest success. So he started building islands. And the problem with islands is it takes a ton of money to move dirt. So he built islands. And islands in big lakes, they have to be long distance from shore, so they get a lot of wave action. So they wash away. Mm -hmm. And then in recent years, Canada geese have expanded throughout the prairies. And Canada geese come in and sit on the island and eat all the vegetation. So there's no nesting cover. So islands Which have... Which gulls like that. Uh, yeah, gulls like that. And so islands have proven to be ineffective management. They just are so expensive to build. They wash away. They have all sorts of problems. And you still have mink predation, so... And peninsula cutoffs were the same idea. You didn't have to move the dirt. You just dug a, 
uh, a moat basically to right. keep the predators away and and equally ineffective because the moat had to be so large so, right so so we've tried lots of different things and mostly they have failed so we have hen houses and uh, and that's the only sort of passive approach that works hen houses are like wood duck boxes right. in other areas they they work um, and and that is really the only passive approach that works other than plant a ton of grass um, and then you can go the other way and say, okay, I'm not going to make nests inaccessible. I'm going to reduce the predator population. Right. And in the old days, we knew that that worked when we were able to reduce predators with poisons. Well, that was outlawed in the 70s. And, and so um, more recently, the Fish and Wildlife Service did one study and found out that trapping really didn't work. And when we looked at it, when Delta looked at it, we said, well, here's the trick. They, they hired a trapper, a government you know, employee, and mm -hmm. we weren't sure that that was the correct approach. So we started a different approach in 1994 where we contracted with professional trappers. They weren't Delta employees. We just contracted with them. And, and trapping, obviously, has worked tremendously well for dabbling ducks. We've done what a dozen studies now at least and yeah and uh, and trapping clearly is an effective approach to management it is the most cost effective way to produce ducks and there's one other thing we should discuss and that's an alternative agricultural approach um, if you've been in the southern prairies in Kansas or Oklahoma you know most of the wheat is winter wheat it's planted in the fall it grows a little while, becomes dormant, and then in the spring, it's, you know, it's about, well, in Kansas, it'll be that high. Yeah. And then it takes off and grows very rapidly in the spring. So winter wheat is, is pretty good management for ducks. We found pretty high nest success. Now, the problem with winter wheat is, you know, it's common in the D South Dakota. Here in North Dakota, it's very rare, and it's virtually non-existent in Prairie Canada because it has a tough time with these super cold winters. But if we can get a strain of winter wheat that'll tolerate the cold, then that'll be good for ducks. It's not great nesting cover early in the spring, but after a month of nesting, then the grass gets up about that high. So a lot of renesting females, and for pintails, which like sparse grass, mm -hmm. then you'll get you'll get pintails nesting in there in pretty high densities. Not high densities, but if you have a sea of winter wheat. Right. You'd, you'd do pretty well. And the nest success numbers for winter wheat are not bad. You know, they're, they're certainly above break even. So the downside of winter wheat is we've been talking about it for 25 years mm -hmm. and we still don't have any winter wheat in North Dakota, right. virtually no winter wheat. And, Why do you think it, that? Is it economics or is it just the, the science it, of growing it? It's just the business of uh, we don't have cold hardy enough, uh, you know, so one year out of three it'll do well and mm -hmm. the other two years you've wasted your money and you're going to go back and rip it up and plant canola anyway so right so we just can't get uptake yet so. yeah so i think you know you, you pointed you said a word there that i think is worth lingering on that was cost effective and right so you went through i think failed is appropriate but it's not that a culvert didn't raise a duck it's or islands right. didn't raise ducks or peninsula cutoffs or all those things it's that they were not cost effective, yep. right? And right. so, you know, at Delta, we we operate on duck hunter dollars. Yep. And so, you know, we have that very strong obligation to to deliver programs that are effective, exactly. and we refine and test those through our research. Yeah. But then we need to deliver programs that are cost efficient. Yes. And so, I mean, really, the list is pretty short. What rises to the top? And our two programs that we deliver are the trapping or predator management, right? And hen houses. And hen houses. I Those mean, are the two things we've found that are, that are by far the most cost-effective ways to manage, and yeah. uh, and everything else pales in comparison. You can plant grass. You could spend millions of dollars and plant grass and get you know some areas producing ducks, but boy, they'd be expensive ducks. And so, I think that's one of the cool things about Delta that you hit on is one. All of our money comes from from largely duck hunters, mm -hmm. and and we feel obligated to them to be efficient. And we have a board of directors that are successful businessmen that 
have a business mindset. And yeah. that's not what traditional wildlife guys, I was never taught about cost effectiveness in college. No. You know, and in all of my, you know, bachelor's, master's, PhD, nobody ever preached to me about being cost effective. They talked about, you know, what is effective management? How can you improve nest success? But with no concern about the dollars involved, mm -hmm. you get businessmen involved and they say, well, we want to know the return on investment. What can you produce a duck for? And, and how can you be more efficient at that? And that's what it's all about. And yeah. That's what I really like about our program. And the other thing is, you know, we know at Delta, we have to protect habitat. Protecting wetlands ought to be, you know, an important job we're doing on the prairies. But protecting wetlands and spending a fortune on wetlands and then having them produce no ducks, that's kind of, that's just stupid. That's yeah. ineffective. Let's, let's do both. Let's do wetland protection and then let's make sure that area actually produces ducks through whatever management we need to do. Hen yeah. houses, predator management, you name it. So, yeah, and, and, and you made a point there. So there's, there's areas on the prairies that are they're not doing well at all and and then there's areas with existing habitat that hatch rates or break even who's happy with break even yeah i mean you know as as one of our donors has said many times 20 percent that's terrible that might be break even but that's terrible let's get it to 50 percent and i completely agree you know let's let's elevate nest success where we can but let's also work efficiently like we would never propose to trap an area that has low carrying capacity 10 ducks per square mile. And, you know, that's that's not where you should trap. You should trap where there are 100 ducks per square mile. So Yeah, you know, that's a good you, point. You need to target your management. That's what we do. We're certainly not thinking we can trap all of the prairies to produce ducks. We would target the highest, you know, breeding uh, density areas, the, those with great carrying capacities. Right. Yeah, yeah you pointed so... There's a tremendous amount of science out there, not just with Delta, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, oh, yeah. other conservation organizations. Yeah. And so we know, based on models, where the ducks are, and right. we know where the habitat is and is not. Right. And so targeting, so trapping, you know, we'll hear people say, well, you can't trap the whole prairies. And we say, well, we don't want to. Yeah, we agree. <laughs> we want to go where the duck de breeding densities are the highest, yeah. and we do that. Um, you know, trapping, um, you know, reached its heyday in probably the 1970s. And, you know, working out on the landscape, there just aren't right. a lot of trappers out there. What right. we run into are more hobby trappers. But so we're basically bringing a trapper and and level the playing field or restore the balance between predator and prey on a targeted yeah. area, get yeah. the maximum return. With hen houses, it's the same thing, except right. hen houses, you know, predator management will positively impact all the upland nesters out there, mallards, right. pintails, gadwall, but hen houses, just mallards. Uh, Frank, right. just any cool facts, what are some other ducks have you seen, heard of nesting in a hen house before? You know, hen houses here in the prairies are largely, as you said, a mallard thing. We will, now we put hen houses, if this is the water level, hen houses go up about, you know, you wanna put them four or five feet above the surface of the water because water level goes up and down. Mm -hmm. um, and so mallards will will occupy them crazy. Mallards love them. Um, but interestingly, we've found uh, redheads jump in them. I'd say right. on the prairies, redheads are number two. Now, if you have wood ducks, we have some wood ducks flying around here and they're looking at these cottonwood trees. Of this. But, but uh, out in the prairies, when we have wood ducks, they'll nest in hen houses for hmm. sure. So that's, that's not a surprise. And then we've had very few other ducks. You know, we have the occasional hooded mergans or nest in them. And, and I think we've ever had one ring neck and, you know, just a smattering of other ducks. And we have, what, eight, 9,000 of them now in the landscape. Yeah. So we've looked at a lot of them. And uh, it's largely targeted for mallards. As a side note, you know, we have, mallards have kissing cousins out east, black ducks, and down in the Gulf Coast, model ducks. And I worked at Louisiana State, and, and I thought, okay, this is the salvation for model ducks, which have terrible nest success. I mean, there are predators galore in Louisiana, and, uh, and we've never had a model duck use one. Like, model ducks and mallards are so genetically similar, you'd think that model ducks would have that adaptability. They don't do it. They yeah, can't. just not. Yeah, not. Not hardwired to do something different. So, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, the yeah. mallards, I've seen mallards nest in some strange places. Yeah. Seats of 
old tractors, tops yeah. of abandoned buildings. Yeah. What's the what's the strangest? Oh, you know, they'll nest in crow nests or red hail hawk nests. They'll they'll readily use those in the parklands. They, they do everything. And in the parklands where we've had nest success being so low, uh, you know, often around 5%, mallards are now making a big transition to nest over water. So they'll go out and act like a canvas back and fold down vegetation that is... Uh, you know, cattails in a slough. So, that's so cool. mallards are very adaptable ducks. That's why they're the number one duck in the country for sure. Nice. So, yeah. Well, I guess kind of, you know, I think we we covered this subject pretty well, Frank. I, 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 this is uh, this is fun for me personally. You know, in the day to day grind, we don't get to stop and just talk about yeah. ducks or conservation. We're are constantly on the go. So this has been fun, Frank. Um, you know. What we've been doing here is, you know, we cover in length and in, in great length and depth, you know, a concept, and then we follow it up with a more focused video. So look for um, a video um, coming out soon um, about Delta's approach to duck production. Yeah. So a deep dive um, just into Delta's work, the yeah. predator management, the hen houses, um, and then also look for, for more podcasts and videos talking about um Again, the science and biology that drives um, waterfowl management. Um, just in review, two podcasts ago, we talked about carrying capacity, and it's the number of wetlands that determine the population potential of ducks. Right. And then today we covered um, waterfowl recruitment or duck production, and it's basically grass and predation that basically determines whether a population of ducks increases, decreases, or stays the same. So. Uh, again, Frank, thanks a lot, and um, appreciate everybody for listening. And um, It's always good to talk about ducks. You bet. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thanks. Good.